Hi guys, welcome to Talent Talk. I'm your guest host, Chingaz Javeri. Is that music getting louder? Ah, we'll discuss that later. Today on the show, we have Mr. Daryl Lennox. Before we get to that, I've been tasked to say, please like and subscribe on the Facebooks. No, that's wrong, on the YouTubes. Also, this is our fourth season, and what Gary's doing is he's putting the entirety of shows, the whole show, on wherever you get your best podcasts. So it's on like Apple, iHeartRadio, Spotify, uh, Spotify, not just to listen to Joe Rogan. You can also watch this stuff. Anyway, guys, please help me welcome a comedian, Mr. Daryl Lennox. Ta-da. Hello, sir. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for cool thanks for taking the time. Name and show business. The the talent talk. The coolest name and show business, Chen Gaze. Wow. Um, I'm gonna get that snippet, and then I'm just gonna use that on the front of my reel. So thank you for that. More than one. Um, we don't make any money off reels, but if there was, you'd get about ten percent of whatever nothing is. So thank you. Um, now I know you're a super busy man, so actually, no, seriously, thank you for 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 doing this, coming out and talking to us. Appreciate where do we, that. Where do we find you right now, by the by? Um, you find me talking about social media? No, no, no. Uh, we'll save oh, that well, till the I'm end. I am in Florida right now. I'm in Saint Petersburg, Florida, on the beach. Uh, oh, right lovely. Now. The weather's great. I think. Uh, yeah, it's a good time here. Lovely, lovely. I uh, yeah, I'm not sure about the uh, the weather over here. We're calling this fine. We're in Calgary, and I think it's a it's a seven. It's a seven. So it's a it's a it's a California fifteen. I that's got what, you. That's what that is. You know. Um. Oh my goodness. So I was going to introduce you uh, as only a comedian, just a comedian, but that's not quite true. You're also like a business guy. You're a business chap now. I'm trying to be. I've uh, I've been putting together this idea, crazy that I am, like Don Quixote, that uh, uh, I want to try to start, you know, acquiring comedy clubs all across North America because I really believe the comedy club industry is is a special special place, and there's an economic upside to it now. I just don't think comedians should have to live in that that space of feast or famine. You shouldn't have to be either Jim Carrey famous or sleeping in your car on your way to Slave Lake. You know, there's a space in between. And I think that's what the club should fill. And so uh, that's what I'm really trying to do. Lovely. Uh, uh, casual shout out to Slave Lake, everyone. Uh, I do. So, so, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I, I've seen some of your stuff from like 2005. And I know you're doing things in Canada. Where did you actually get your start? I started in Seattle, October of 89 at the Comedy Underground in Seattle. It was uh, still and always will be one of my favorite places ever. Um, I don't know if it's even existence in the board. If it isn't, I'm going to try to resurrect it. That's that's me and my goofy way of believing that everything's possible. But uh, it was an exciting time. You know, Seattle was an incredible city at the time. You know, the... Mm-hmm. Ken Griffey Jr., Alex Rodriguez, uh, Pearl Jam, Nirvana, all those things were going at the same time. The comedy was just exploding. Uh, And so I got to go on stage at Swanee's Comedy Underground for the first time in my life. I'd never tried stand-up ever before. And I got up and I lit that thing up, man. And so (laughs) I lit it up, Chen Gaze. It was cool. And so uh, uh, at the end of of my little five-minute set, uh, the the club manager said, I want you to audition for the Seattle Comedy Competition the next night, which was a huge, huge, huge comedy competition, still is. And mm-hmm. so and I said, I will never do anything for the rest of my life. And I haven't. Nothing. Never had a job. I've just been <sighs> slinging jokes and barnstorming around the world. Oh, that is amazing. Uh, were you a kid? I don't need to know the age because then I can mathematically uh, work it out. I don't, I don't, but were you a kid when you went, uh, when you did that? Uh, I was 20, so I'm 56 now. So I was 20 years, I'm entering year 33. So okay. yeah, I was 23 years old. Yeah. Okay. That's still, that's still pretty young. Now I have heard, uh, some comedians start out ridiculously, like, like too early to even be in a club. You know what I mean? So I was right. just wondering about that. Um, Okay. Seattle. 
Nice. I, I, I'm like 89. My brain's just being like, like we're making jokes about uh, George Bush Jr. You know, like I'm just trying to like trying to figure out the time. So 89, it was, uh, it was very Dan Quayle jokes. Okay. Um, it potato. Was, uh, Spelling of potato. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and, and the the I see Sam books and stuff he was talking about reading, and everybody had a Suzuki Samurai joke. Uh, <laughs> everybody had a Clarence Thomas joke. Uh, okay. It was, yeah, it was it was silly stuff, man. And you had to do it fast. You had to do it last per minute too. You had to go. It's good to be here because I was in Pocatello, Idaho, and there it's 1976. You had to do everything really fast and stupid, terrible, but it made oh. me good back then. But did you awful. now have you obviously you've changed and you've grown as a as a as a man, but like did you uh if are you more storyteller now with, with your jokes or are you are you still punchline guy? Uh both actually. I started out as a storyteller and then in order to get work you had to do the jokes per minute. Uh and then I came to Canada after mm -hmm. a divorce uh in ninety four and then I just got my hat handed to me in northern BC and Alberta and Manitoba by trying to be the jokes per minute guy. So I had to stop and and go back to my original roots of telling a story and being observational. So I kind of stay there now. Interesting. I guess you'd been in the game long enough that even when you maybe weren't performing up to what you know you thought or what some of the audience thought, you were like, I don't give a crap what these Canadians say I'm a professional I'm just going to keep doing this you know but if that if that was much earlier like um I've heard from a lot of comedians who their first set first two sets they killed absolutely killed they're like oh this is this is quite I, I can do this and then they get went out that second or third time and it was death and they're just like yeah bye bye I'm gonna go be an accountant or something so um how many years were you in when you came here <laughs> I was in uh, year five, and so I was fooling a lot of people with my last per minute and uh, my think and grow rich, you know, how to become successful, power subconscious mind stuff. So I tried to shortcut the circuit, uh, mm -hmm. and then, I, you know, my my wife Jill at the time, you know, God rest her soul, kind of kicked my ass a little bit and made me grow up. So I ended up coming to Canada with five years of just hocus pocus and and nothing, pap. And so mm -hmm. I just got destroyed. I mean, I got literally got destroyed bomb because there's no bomb. There's no worse bomb than bombing in, in Northern Canada. There's, there's nothing <laughs> better. There's nothing. <laughs> there's nothing. There's nothing. Uh, and so uh, <laughs> I had to really dig deep and figure out what the hell I was talking about in order to make those people laugh. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure what that, that says more about us or, or, or you. Um, I'm just thinking, my brain just went to like, if you were, um, you were uh, trying to get in the NFL and you were like, nah, damn it. I got, I got to do the CFL where the guys are about 60 pounds uh, smaller. And then you, and then you couldn't do it. Do you know what I mean? You couldn't do it in the CFL. Uh, I just had that sort of a. No, nah, bro. It's way worse there. Cause at least you didn't get the CFL. You can, you still consider yourself a pro athlete, but it was, it's like, uh, no matter how hard my, I grew up hard in the city stores and my father was a pimp, blah, 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 blah. You're sitting, you know, way up there in, in Cash Creek or somewhere and mm -hmm. few people got few fingers uh, and, and you know, just, just horrible life stories that are way worse than the stuff I made up in my head. And so you, you have to make those people laugh and connect with them on a whole different level than you know, woe is me because society is hard on me. This dude, you know, got mm -hmm. his knee cut off in a tractor accident. He just want to laugh in some fear. And so he don't have no time for no Dan Quayle jokes. You know what I mean? Um, yes, I get it. And um, well, at least he's got a good seat in the house. Let's hope. Let's yeah. hope, you know, you wheel that guy in. Hopefully he's right up near you at the stage. Um, I'm going to get off that topic uh, quickly. And there's a, there's a bunch of people over here who are saying hello. There's like some, uh, you know, Susan, uh, someone else is, uh, there's a Leslie. I was always saying you're a great interview. Oh, okay. Okay, oh. Leslie. You know, what about uh, what about host? Yeah, didn't think about that very well. Anyway, um, get that off the screen. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, um, should I get back to uh, uh, when, when you were talking about woe is me and you said, uh, dad was a pimp. 
are you just like re are you just telling me about the the jojo dancer story or is this a, like a, a real life the thing uh yeah that's, that's real that's real man oddly enough uh richard pryor who you're referring to in case people mm -hmm. know who we call you richard pryor uh his middle name is richard thomas franklin lennox pryor so i always love that and then uh his father was a pampers mother uh wrote brothels and then uh, mm -hmm. I met my father um, in the summer of 83, uh, and he was a pimp, and he was, you know, coming out of the game because, uh, you know, crack cocaine had kicked up, but he still, you know, he's just what he did. He was a pimp in the, in the 70s and, and the 80s, and that's what he did, and sold drugs. And as much as my mom did not want me to go and see him because mm -hmm. she had been hurt by him, I wanted to go and just find out my DNA. You know, and uh, it was probably one of the most difficult things I've ever had, uh, trying to make somebody be a dad that didn't want to be a dad. Uh, mm -hmm. But he still, because he lived his life the way he lived his life, it gave me an opportunity to have some freedom to be independent. Um, and right. that gave me a chance to become, you know, play, ball, play basketball and become a comedian. And so I feel like I have my mother's work ethic and my father's ability to take crazy chances. But uh, we're still we're, we're we're like the best of best of friends now. I don't know if I love anybody as much as I love, you know, my pops. It's crazy, oh, but I still love him. He's he's still with us. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good. Lovely. You know, cancer stuff, some hard stuff, but he's still mm -hmm. he's still out there trying to get the girls I have on Facebook to come work for him. <laughs> Wait, he's he's still in the he's still in the biz. <laughs> No, he just likes to pretend he just, he's 78, but he's still thinking catch him. That's his big goal is to catch a young one on Facebook. So, Oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah, I guess I never thought about that. But that life, that, uh, if you're in that business, uh, you actually do have to have uh, some sort of charm. Like you need a game. You need, you, need to, you, know, you need to be good at lines. You need to, like, pull. You need to pull. I guess you need to be good at pulling uh, ladies. Both oh, like man. Spoken like a man who was pulled before. Nobody says pull unless they know how to pull. Chin game. No, no, I'm a little bit English. It's, just, it's a common, it's a common, not, I right. uh, stop that. This isn't about me, sir. It's about you. You and your dad, the pimp. Now, generally, I'm the one who says uh, weird stuff on this show. That's what I do. You know, I'll just start talking and I'll say something about Hitler. And then I can see my producer going, what the hell? I can just see his hands waving in the background. I'm like, please stop that. And I'm like, right, right. I'm just saying. You know, uh, trains ran on time in Germany. You're like, you know what? Do you want this canceled? Do you want to be canceled? And I'm like, maybe, maybe. There's a million books I haven't read. Maybe I'd like to be canceled. I'm going to get to my notes because I wrote something. Uh, I wrote the word basketball. Uh, <laughs> you did allude to it. You said you got to play basketball. Um, should I be reading? There are a few other comments over here. There's someone, uh, there's a Bob. Do you like to know if anyone has ever commented about your cute ears? Oh, goodness. Uh, I don't know. Um, has anyone ever commented about your cute ears? Would you like to speak about your years or ears? English wasn't my first language or basketball. Uh, let's stick to basketball. Those are two very close friends of mine in Palm Springs that like to push my buttons about. Uh, it's, uh, I'm not going to this conversation. It's ridiculous. Oh, done. Strike it. Strike Bob's comment. Thank you, producer. Um, so basketball. So what did you you uh, you played high school? Uh, well, hold on, hold on. How tall were Six three. you? Six three. Six. Yep. That's a good height. And when you yep. were playing, what sort of weight did you float float float? Uh, so I was one seventy eight up to about one ninety by the time I finished. Man, you were quick then. Were you a swing uh, forward? I was playing point guard. Man, this this is like real oh. basketball Canadian guy. Okay, okay, easy, easy. <laughs> I played against the Cuban national team one time. All right, so just relax there. <clears throat> I got to I got to work out near Magic Johnson <laughs> once. <laughs> Thrill of a lifetime. Um, no, no, but okay. So you, no, that's very. Then you're very fast. You were you were a fast a fast cat. Real real quick lateral movements, could pass the ball, lock you up on defense. Uh, even though my eyes were. I had bad depth of possession, so I couldn't tell how far I was shooting from. So I gave me uh -huh. range. So I. You know, I was like, that's 30 feet. Oh, it looked like 12 to me. So I shot it in. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, very quickly, I'm only 5'9 and a smidge. And when I played, uh, I was 200 pounds. I played 200 pounds. 
just a slightly over 30 inch vertical and could palm the basketball with either hand at grade yeah. seven. So I just rebounded and played inside, uh, right. used to score one point a game, but give you five boards and one technical foul a game. Thank you very much. Oh. Yeah, all them. Oh, them so Hitler, bad. Hitler jokes don't go grill on the basketball court either, huh? Uh, no, David, I don't think I did it back then. I wasn't in the media. I wasn't in the public eye. I saved that stuff for the public eye. That's, all right. come on. Um, let me see. Um, all right. Where else are we? Basketball. Oh, so did you play, uh, you went collegiate too, didn't you? You played in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I played uh, junior college, uh, Seattle. Universe, and then uh, I got a little lift to uh, UW, which didn't last very long because I was immature. Uh, and so oh. then I got on stage, and that was it. I was supposed to be trying to find a new school to play at, but then I got on stage on the underground. And I was like, this is the rest of my life. That's what I did. Well, it's a lot easier on the knees. That's for sure. Um, I think. I don't know. The well, entertainment business, there's probably a dirty joke in there, but I'm not even going to talk about it. I'll leave well, it. I'm going to get back to my notes. Um, uh, how do you start your day? That's boring. Who wrote that? It was me. How do you start your day, man? Your I day? get up, uh, usually around four o'clock in the morning. And then I get up and I go and sit. Uh, I talk to my plants. I've got incredible bamboo and a fern and other, I don't know what it is. So, and then I have a little purple rock here. I don't know if this shows up for purple rock amethyst. It does. And then, uh, and then I meditate. So uh, the deep, uh, powerful meditation takes about 45 minutes, an hour to get done, to reset my day. Uh, and then uh, I start my uh, start my day with my affirmations after that. You know, I, <clears throat> it's, this whole business thing is in critically important to me. And so uh, and, and now the Super Bloom is doing well. And, you know, we're putting together a set for a talk show that can't be named yet. And so it feels like the career is about to get another springboard, but all of that is just based on the awareness of making, you know, my business dreams come true for me and all the comedians that I've come across. And so that's what I do. And sometimes it's frustrating because all I do is meditate and wait. Mm -hmm. And then people that are around me that have the same aspirations as me want me to make their dreams come. They get upset and anxious because I'm not meditating or waiting fast enough for them. <laughs> 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 Te teach you, them how to meditate and then they'll be you, more calm have you changed my life yet uh I'm, I'm working on it okay hey hey have you have you made things easier for me yet okay i'm still still meditating man uh so there's nothing i can do except meditate wait you know, there's no i can't that's all i can do so that's how i start my day that's and make phone calls meditate wait and make phone calls uh you would think so right hmm um, okay, you mentioned Super Bloom, and I want to talk about, which I assume is a, a Judy Bloom fan fiction that you've probably been working on for years. Uh, we will get to that because okay. there's, I don't know if you know about Calgary at all, but like we have a giant Judy Bloom uh, fan uh, base here. So they're going to be into that big time. Um, the meditation is funny. I was actually wondering about, um, you know, a lot of people who come off centered who feel, who have an, uh, have an essence of centered. I did something with my hands. I don't know what that looks like, but anyway, uh, who come off, who have an essence of centeredness seem to be people who meditate. And I'm just starting to try and get into it. And actually it's because of this show, uh, just because I get a little nervous with the liveness, you know, of it. Uh, I'm just like, what if I say something weird? Uh, so you, I, I just take about 10 minutes before the show, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, okay. How long have you been doing that for? Um, most uh, most of my most of my teenage life, I learned about it uh, at a basketball camp. Uh, Jamal Wilkes for the Lakers basketball camp back in the day, and number fifty-two. That's right. Hey, good memory. Uh, <laughs> and then um, so then I just different variations of that, but I've really taken it to a different level. Uh, with uh, one of my best friends and my assistant, Suzanne Stewart, introduced me to a guy named uh, Joe Dispenza. And so he's really, his meditation really helped me mm -hmm. since I've gone blind uh, to really just kind of control the energy and, and connect to the space and everything, because not seeing anything. That's all there is, is energy and space. So I really kind of dug into that. Uh, so it's been, it's, it's been a lifelong process, man, but it's really taken mm -hmm. a lot of different levels since the blindness and the business mm -hmm. ring 
terms of everything else. All right. Um, well, you know, we can talk about that a little bit. Uh, I know your the last album was Blind Ambition, and I'm like, is that was that um, was that going blind? And you used that sort of title, or is it like was it after? I can't remember it, the timeline of. It was. It was, uh, I was about to have a surgery uh, on my right eye because I had a cataract that was becoming dominant. And so, because even, even though my eyes, you know, a cataract isn't necessarily a serious thing, but because my eyes are so tenuous and weak, that there was a chance, being only one eye, that I could go blind. And so, of course, I worked myself into a frenzy that if I did go totally blind, you know, I would, I would kill myself. And so... Uh, so that happened. The surgery happened in 2009, uh, and then I released. I did 2000, 2010. We did Blind Ambition, released in 2012. And so now, uh, Super Bloom is a follow-up to that because now that I am totally blind, and I feel like I'm more powerful, more dynamic blind than I ever was, even with a little bit of vision. Mm. And no, Super Bloom is not about Judy Bloom, although I do love Judy Bloom books. <laughs> Hell of God, are you there? It's me, Margaret. <laughs> You're like, look, I'm saving this, and then I'm going to give it to him. But three sentences later, this son of a bitch from Calgary making fun of my life's work. <laughs> look, man, uh, I'm the host, all right? So don't show me up. Don't show me. And you know this isn't even my regular, I got a boss, okay? Whew. Anyway, um, and how long have you been married to her again? <laughs> uh, well, we're, we're living in sin, sir. But oh, uh, okay. it's been 31, 32. Uh, from, I met her when you went up first time on, in Seattle. That's when okay. I met her in high school, oh, right. in grade wow. 10 ish. Wow. Yeah. 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 So, right. yeah, well, we were friends for, but we, we've been sort of together about 31 years. Anyway, right. you can't tell how old I am because I colored my hair earlier. <clears throat> anyway, not you, but some of the viewers. Uh, where the hell? I wanted to talk about something during that. Oh, yes. So the focus that you get or that you have now that you didn't have previously, um, being blind. Oh, it's even hard to say. It's difficult for me to say. And I, I did talk to you earlier in a pre sort of thing. There's one of my greatest fears. And I got that. I got the Glock in one of the eyes, you know, just a little center gray now. So I'm just ignoring it. Like uh, all men do, you just ignore things. Right. Like, That'll probably just be fine, right? Later, like no worries. Um, but when you are dealing with people you don't know, how do you like um, are using all your daredevil senses? How do you get the essence of a person? How serious they're being? How genuine? You know, what is what does that look like now? I don't know why I said look. You'll forgive me. Um, Christian. You know what's what's wild about it is that. Um, the external, you know, doesn't get for me. So they could come up to me, you know, in it, no matter color, no matter, you know, gender, no matter anything. And the energy, you know, you can't trick your energy. And so, mm -hmm. so I can feel all of that. You know, I can literally feel all that because everything else is, we, we either connect energetically or we don't. So I'm not distracted by, you know, the hair color or the, the COVID mask versus the clan mask. It's all muffled to me. So I just feel wow. energy. It's just stripped. It's stripped down. That's what, it's stripped down to the okay. literally raw energy. Yeah. Wow. Um, and that's way more safer than being distracted or fooled by you know physical appearances or you know they didn't see that I didn't see their tattoos. Right. So people come to me. It's just their pure essence that has to connect with me. Okay. So that's it. I mean, I can see. I can see that as you're saying it. I can see it as a. Well, I mean, it, it is the tool that you have to use as well. And I, and I can see it being a, uh, an amazing way of cutting through all the other, you know, the nonsense or yeah. whatnot. Like, oh, let's look at a person's shoes or their watch to see how rich they are or whatever it is, you know, like. But, or the political physics. I'm a Republican. Okay, well, you just sound like a dude to me. So now right. what do you want to talk about? Right, 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 right. Um, I have I have, I have, have acted before where I, I, I didn't have any, I, I couldn't see the other actors and it was you know quite a difficult thing where i was like I, I can't see what's happening on their faces now i can't i just can't and i couldn't really deal with it it just didn't work for me you know it was, it was just a just a weird thing anyway just a just another thing talking about myself which is what i do over here if you were speaking to gary 
let's face it, uh, you'd be speaking and he'd just be smiling, you know, because he's just a good hearted man. I'm going back to my notes. Uh, let's see. Oh, did you, did you, uh, which, which, which was the, which was the uh, album you self-funded? I know you self-funded one early. So we did Blind Ambition through the help of uh, two of my greatest friends, the Anglings, and then Stand Up Records, which is, you know, the label that did Blind Ambition and Super Bloom. Uh, it was a, a cumulative effort, but it was something that I wanted to take the lead on and, and, and try to push and promote. But I could not have done anything without them. Uh, but that Blind Ambition was the one. Uh, and so I know if I don't say that, I get yelled at by everybody because they all think that uh, I, I'm an arrogant wide receiver instead of a humble hockey player sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm in that list of people's names you have to remember. It's getting yeah, longer and longer, man. Like, I've been doing this, what, what, how, what did you say, 33 years? Do you say 30, This is year 33 now, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, this is your Kareem year or your bird year, depending on what you uh, – yeah, you know, I'm bringing back the basketball, and I shouldn't. The viewers don't want that. Um, what uh, what would you say your big break was, man? You had a big break. Um, been like three big three big breaks to get you here, talking to me on this show. Uh, at the time, they all felt immensely huge. Mm -hmm. um, probably that first call to get even at the improv. Uh, from Pat Wilson, uh, probably the second one was uh, Jill uh, kicking me out of L.A. and coming to Canada. Um, and then the third one was uh, uh, Mary and Claire. But if you want actual showbiz things, I, I would know. say I would say uh, um, the Working with Chris Rock for the first time had a huge impact on me. Wow. Um, in uh, what, what capacity? Can we stop you there for a second? What, what, in what way were you uh, working with that guy? Uh, so I had been up in Canada. This was the spring. This was March of uh, 95. And mm -hmm. uh, I'd been in Canada for about a year. And I'd really gotten really, really, really strong uh, at making the folks in the Vanderhoof laugh hard. And so... I thought that I was really ready. So I was down in Sacramento at the Punchline Comedy Club, one of the best clubs in the country. So I headlined Wednesday, Thursday, and then Chris Rock came and headlined Friday, Saturday. Mm -hmm. And because this is, you know, the cable cat, the cable package in Canada wasn't real strong back then, so I couldn't get a hold of the HBO. So I did not know that Chris Rock had to bring the pain uh, mm -hmm. HBO special, which was a masterpiece. But I was still thinking he was Nat X uh, Saturday Night Live, Chris Rock. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I went on stage in front of him, and I thought he wouldn't be able to follow me. And he just embarrassed me with how much better he was than me. Uh, and it made me really dig even deeper, like when I had to go through Canada pain, and and, mm -hmm. and made me talk about what's really in my life. And and then he he gave me some incredible compliments the next night. Uh, and and so that made me realize that a I could play on the level that he was playing at. And that was my first like real confidence building. Okay, like I could play. Here's a basketball part for you. So after I, I did a whole new set the next night, he said, what the hell happened to you? Mm -hmm. And I said, I know now what it feels like when Scottie Pippen practiced against Michael Jordan for the first time. He was that much better than me. And so, but once I started to get it, he really, he really let me know that I could play at that level. So that was a real big thing for me. Nice. I'm assuming uh, when some comedians hear Chris Rock, it would be like, the first time you saw Robin Williams or the first time you, you know, heard Richard Pryor, uh, maybe on his comeback, because let's face it, no, no one really could touch Richard Pryor in his, you know, <clears throat> in his full cocaine days. Uh, but I think he would retire people. You know what I mean? You just see him and you'd be like, oh, right, I don't do this. This is why, why do I think I do this job? And you just leave. You know what I mean? So um, yeah. I'm glad he... He did that for me. He he didn't make me feel like I wanted to quit. <clears throat> I don't I don't know how to quit, but he did say it was you know to learn how to fight. So I learned how to fight the next night, and then from that moment on, mm -hmm. that those are the levels I've aspired to be on. I'm always trying to coach and teach big league ball. This is how you got to play at this level. This is what you got to do. Okay. Um, I was going to ask a little bit about writing and sort of maybe do you listen to music and what what do you when you are writing. 
Um, but I also kind of want to touch upon when you make a new album, a new set, a new whatever, how much of the old stuff do you kind of hold on to? Or are you just starting from scratch again? What is the, uh, that's a double, that's two questions in there, but you know, you're, you're an adult. You'll, you'll, you'll do it. Um, not being able to write anymore has been one of the hardest things for me because I was definitely a journaler, a pen to paper guy. And so now that, that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and so now I have to pick everything intellectually. And so if I, if I feel something that I heard, whether it be a movie or a song or a conversation or anything, whatever, and I go, Ooh, that seems like I'm supposed to talk about that. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I kind of just pretend like I'm my own therapist, start asking myself the question, okay, why is this important to you? What are you trying to say? You know, how are you trying to make people feel by this, by that? And so I know my core beliefs are, you know, I don't want to say anything bad about anybody and where's the love in it first, mm -hmm. where's the funny in it second, and how's this going to inspire, galvanize? And those are things I'm looking for. So uh, when the world is changing the way it's changing, because I didn't get to see, you know, anything. I didn't get to see any of George Floyd or the mask or anything. To, to I didn't see none of that. So, so I had to listen to people talk about it. So I go, okay, how can I make using my core beliefs fine? Where's the love in this? Where can I galvanize people in this and make it funny? Mm -hmm. And so I, I have to use those foundations. And then I just keep talking out till the funny shows up. But I never chase the funny first. I always chase the concept and the premise and then trust the funny is going to show up. And then I just remember it. Okay. Oh, I, yeah. I, was, I didn't actually think about when I said writing, writing the pen to paper. But, yeah, I guess most comedians they have crazy amounts. They have books like serial killers do, I suppose. But I, uh, but I, but I, I, was, I figured you'd maybe do a, like a talk to text thing and just keep where and they listen to it. Ah, oh, I like this part of that part. But, no, you're doing it all kind of in your head. And then. In my head, yeah. Yeah. When it comes out, it's basically a fully formed. Um, well, what about what about uh, old stuff and new stuff? You know, like like I know, like someone like Jerry Seinfeld, he just keeps all his old stuff. And like, I mean, uh, I, you know, I think it's the height of laziness, but like he just sort of he's got this thing and it was perfect uh, 20 years ago. And he just he just sort of um, massages it a little bit and he and he keeps most of it. And, and then that's what people love. They love that. They want that. They want that old stuff. You know, it's like listening to your favorite band or something. You don't want to hear some new thing. And then they go out and listen to that. But, um, but I was just wondering, yeah, do you keep, a, 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 what, what do you do with old stuff? Uh, it's in my head somewhere. Uh, and if somebody asks, hey, can you do that bit? I'll see if I can remember it. Well, you got to remember at that time, you know, the way people consume comedy is way different than now. I don't think you get away with that now. I, I think because people devour so much comedy content mm. uh, that you just couldn't because people not only are li they listen to your jokes online all the time or on their phone all the time. And so there's no element of surprise anymore. So I just don't think that would work now. Okay. So, so it's, so it's fresh material every time you start you, a new you, thing. You try to, you know, I'm project based. And so, I, I'm, I want to be on this show or I want to do the next this. So okay. I'm project ready. So I just store stuff until I, until I find a project I'm going to start working on. Okay. Okay. And your next, your next, next big project is, uh, is with, with Yuck Yucks. That's what you're going to be. Um, that's what you're going to be um, working on, right? I'm starting. Uh, so we're, we're uh, taking down a club here on the beach in Coconuts, another heritage brand. And a sports bar next to it, and then but Yuck X has been you know a dream of mine for almost five years now, uh, and the timing and and the funding just hasn't been right yet. But I think we're getting very close. Uh, but primarily focus is on the the first proof of concept club here on the beach, and then mm -hmm. if God willing and Mark Brunson uh, are agreeable, then we'll make this thing happen. But I'm just not going to stop till it's done. You know, I just, I'm not going to stop till it's done. It's my whole soul's purpose now. So when you, uh, I believe that I, I, you know, I, I do believe that like you're a snowball going down a hill or, or a train <laughs> coming down a hill. So, uh, there's 15 yuck yucks <clears throat> in Canada. Is that right? That's what I recall. I haven't 
haven't done the latest thing post COVID, okay. but okay. it was somewhere in that neighborhood. Okay. And so when, when you have them, what are you going to do differently with these clubs um, to sort of help comedians or is it like, um, are you going to do like a Sundance thing where you get people to come in and they have mentors and like, what, what is the, um, yeah, what are you going to do, do differently than other than own these clubs? Let's let's focus on, you know, the community part of it first, you know, because what Mark, uh, president and the owners of Yucca have done is they've given paid and comedians an opportunity to get better at their craft. And so because, he, you know, he built a brand that's a legacy brand like what Freeman Improv did, you know, there was a different time. So what I would like to do you know, is maintain a lot of those same similar concepts that the, both the great uh, founding fathers of comedy club transits have done. Mm -hmm. But I want to focus more on how to make the community better as a whole. I think there's more ways to generate different revenue streams than just, mm -hmm. you know, paying out of, you know, uh, nacho and beer money. Uh, okay. and I don't want to go into specific details because, you know, now you're asking from a secret sauce. Nope. Uh, I apologize. You, yeah, you've given me one of that. your 11 herbs and spices and I, uh, and I, yeah. I can, I can make hay with that for a and while. I do want to, I do want to pay respect to, you know, to Mark, you know, until I actually, you know, uh, put the, the money in his hand. I don't want to over talk about, you know, what I want to do and all sort of stuff. Cause you know, it's, I've gotcha. put that horse before the cart many times before and it's not good for everybody. Gotcha. 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 Um, my producers helped me out over here, uh, and he's let me know that apparently Seth Rogen noted some advice you gave him in his new book. Can you tell us what that what that advice was? Uh, yeah, we were we were at the in in Vancouver at the Urban Well with club a little Tuesday night thing that was spectacular. It started by Jamie Hutchinson and Brent Butt. Okay. And uh, Chingay's, it was in Kisilano, so the, the girls were unbelievable. Uh, it's where I met my Claire, my, my second wife, my best friend. Uh, and they, they, it was incredible. At that time, you know, think mm -hmm. of this list of people who were there at that time. So uh, Seth was just starting out. He was 16. Zach Galifianakis was there. Brent Butt was there. I was there. Some of the best, best, best comics. Kevin Nealon came. Rob Williams came through. Sarah Silverman came. Everybody came through to that Tuesday night. So it was it was packed. It wow. was legendary. And so on a particular night, um, Seth uh, didn't do well. Mm -hmm. uh, and he came back. And uh, so I grabbed him. We sat up against the wall. At the wall and I said, basically, what are you doing? You know, you're trying to talk about these adult concepts. You know, you're 16. Mm -hmm. you, could, you, you could be the only person in the club who could be talking about the first time they ever kissed a girl or touched a titty or whatever. You're talking mm -hmm. this other stuff. You're talking about bike cops. And I guess that stuck with him. And so... He began to work on his act and, and, and about that stuff. And then he later gave me credit for that piece of advice to helping his career and why he wrote super bad. And, and he's, he's been incredible, incredibly generous by, you know, including me in, in a lot of his pressures. And, you know, I can't thank him enough for that. That's lovely, man. And, and, and he's been talking about touching ladies breasts ever since. So good for yeah. you. Uh, <laughs> You uh, do you consider yourself a, a mentor, or like, are, are you are you getting to be like the grand old man of comedy? Is that is that kind of what's happening? Uh, I would use a different euphemism than that. Um, <laughs> but uh, all right, <laughs> a man uh, plays against the Cuban national basketball team. He feels like is uh, you know taking Viagra. But yes, no, no, I'm 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 a fifty year old man now. You just. You know, someone will describe what my hair looks like to you, and you're like, oh, he doesn't feel 50. But no, I'm an old man. I got broken knees and everything. I just meant uh, you're older than me, and, you know, uh, you're at a, you're on the other side of the North America. So what are you going to do? Um, I love I love being able to help because I had great people help me. Like mm -hmm. I said, Chris Rock and Chappelle. Like, that, I've, I've been lucky some of the best of the best so many walks of life I've learned from. And so, you know, and I've dedicated my whole life to comedy. And when I see a comic or hear a comic, you know, I think it can help a little bit. I will. I will, I will, I will say this though. I've had to lean back with some of my helping so much because a lot of times it isn't people don't want 
you know, the same levels of, of achievement or tensity that I do. And so my advice is geared towards this is how you play in the big leagues. And they're like, hey, I just wanted to get out of the house and work on some jokes. Right. And so I'm, I'm a lot more, okay, if I can really feel that they really care about this, then I'm a lot more helpful that way. But I also have plenty of time for the people that just, that just want to get out of the house and work on a joke. But I do love helping comics. I really do. Okay. Well, yeah, that's uh, that's wonderful, and and I know that uh, that trait is going to be passed on to the people you help uh, at a dimish- diminishing rate, though. Like whatever you're giving to these people, sixty percent of them are going to give that to the next generation. So that's pretty cool. You know what I mean? I hope so. Um, yeah. Um, it's like having kids. I've been told. I don't know. I got a cat. Um, you know, we've hit, we've hit 41 minutes, but we haven't done 41 jokes. So I believe that's on us. We both have to take the responsibility for that. So anyway, um, I want to ask, uh, yeah, I think we're, I don't know. We're getting near the end of this. I feel I've worn out my welcome in, in Florida. Um, I uh, I don't. I've already meditated. I have anything else I need to do. But if you want to keep asking, fine. If you want to, uh, anybody out there has some questions, that's fine. Uh, if you want to wrap it up, that's fine too. Well, I, you know, I I did have a question about if there's any tips you had for 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 kids or not really kids, but sort of new people trying to come out and trying to do stand up. Uh, but also, I wanted to ask if um, uh, it, I don't I don't know if we should watch that. Um, yeah, we've got a bit of we've got a bit of your um, stand up, and I wasn't sure if we should play something for the people out there. Uh, that's kind of where I'm at right now. I've gotten to the end of my notes. It said things I don't do. It, I've gotten I've, I made notes things I shouldn't say or do, and I don't want to get to that. I'll save that for when we're not live. Okay, that'll just be for you and I. All right. <laughs> um, or- Tips go. Uh, there's nothing I believe more uh, important or impactful than your own sense of humor, and stick to that, and don't deviate it for anybody else. To your sense of humor, and and so a lot of times when you're trying to be validated or liked or approved, mm-hmm. we kind of deviate from our sense of humor to try to find what somebody else's sense of humor is, and that's you know that's really uh, not the greatest path to be on. Okay. What if, um, you know, be true to yourself that I, I get that, but what if no one likes what you're doing or bringing to the, to the table? Like what, what do you, you know, you just come out and someone's super esoteric and you're like, man, no one's going to get, maybe in three years, this is going to be funny. What advice, you know, what do you do for those people? Uh, you can ask Larry David has worked with him, right? Um, did he do stand up back in the day? I never heard oh, of him yeah. until he was right. Yeah, yeah. He did stand up back in the day, and he used to bomb with the best of them. But he developed his own sense of humor, just because it's funny. If it's funny to you, it's just funny. Got it. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, we'll take that as advice. Um, we should uh, we should talk about where where can we find. Your uh, your super bloom, which I believe came out on December seventeenth. December seventeenth, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm so proud of that thing. Uh, thank you, Dan Schlissel, for uh, always kicking my ass and doing things at your own pace, but expect me to do things exactly where you want them done all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you always come up with great product. Uh, I love being part of your team, bro. Um, I'm so proud of that album. Uh, because, you know, there's a contextual thing behind it with the flower. I mean, the, the, the wildfires and fires in uh, California burning mm-hmm. and people losing lives and property. And at the time I'm going through tough things and, and then the flooding and in t- at times, you know, we've all felt just simply overwhelmed. Like it's, there's nothing you can do about it. Like these mm-hmm. random acts of sociological or natural economic violence happens to you. You don't know what to do. You feel like you feel like the universe turns its back on you. Mm-hmm. But all that rain and that fly fire and everything caused a burst of poppies just so spectacular uh, that people from all around the world came to see it and revitalized that uh, community's economy. And so that's what life is sometimes. It 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 
it really drags you around. But then on the other side, there's this incredible burst of, oh, this is why it happened. That's mm -hmm. what I felt like going through with, you know, Jill, you know, committing suicide and my dad, you know, getting cancer. And 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 then, you know, I produced that. I, I came with that album concept. And and mm -hmm. so, yeah, I'm very proud of it. And I'm glad people seem to be responded to it. Um, but you can get on all the platforms. Stand up the records is put on all the platforms. Um, okay. Just all the platforms. Just the go platforms. to a C train station because we're in Canada, and uh, yep. and uh, that's a platform. And ask for just to go into your local grocery store and start yelling "Super Bloom." Someone will come up to you. Uh, Susan is asking, "When will you be performing? When will you be back?" God damn it, I can't read. Hold on. When will you be back performing in Canada? Oh, when will you be back performing in Canada? See, if I was a professional, um, I'd have just said it like that. Uh, I I don't want to tell everybody exactly when I'll be back because then I won't get any sleep. Everybody will be coming to the crib. But I do know that uh, I believe that I'm booked on the island May 2nd, 3rd, and 4th uh, with... Um, and that's Prince Ed Prince Edward Island, get kids. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, right, he opens. It's on the half hour every half uh, hour. That's all right. All right, I deserve that one. You got me. <laughs> um, no, so you're you're in you're in Vancouver. Uh, was it what, second, third, and was it second, third, and second, fourth? And fourth somewhere in, in the first week in of May, I think. So that's yeah, over right. in Victoria up the island. So it's always lovely. a good time. Yeah, lovely, lovely. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, the only thing I work on less, uh, than the introductions is the outros on this, on this particular show. But, um, but yeah, I think we're, uh, I think we've done it, man. We hit 47 Good. minutes right. and, uh, I, I appreciate you taking this time so much. And I know that you, you're still just, you're still going up. That's the thing. Cause when, you know, I talked to you on Thursday, you're like, Oh, what are you gonna do? Ah, this, this. Ah, I might go. I might go do a set. You know. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah. Probably go do a set tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. boy. Okay. Well, um, I really, really appreciate you taking this time and talking to us and giving us a little bit of advice and, yeah, just sharing some of that thirty-three years of of uh, whatever, and also just being uh. Uh, hope, hopefully helping some of the some of the people out there to be a little bit focused you know it's i care <clears throat> that's uh, I, I just care so i hope mm. i hope uh i hope people understand that and that uh you know even again when when it all seems scary or you don't have any control over a thing you know um meditate and wait meditate and wait it uh now i'm gonna butcher this it might work but it probably, probably won't. <laughs> yeah. probably won't yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, Daryl, oh, thank you. So oh, hold yeah. a second. I think somebody just threw my own joke in my face. Hold on a second. Let me get this off. Oh, wait. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Um, no, I appreciate you uh, and, and, and doing this. It's been very kind. Listen, you, you stick around for a minute. Uh, and then Gary usually just apologizes for me to our guests, so we'll do that. But we won't we won't bother the public with that nonsense. And then I got to tell you some of these things I wrote down, which I, I, I shouldn't say in public. So hey, all right, you got that looking forward to. Anywho, um, all right, guys, listen, uh, talent talk uh, fans out there, we'll probably be back next week. Probably be Gary. Let's face it. I, I think I, I think I'm getting fired, and uh, he's gonna have another guest. I'm sure they're excellent as well. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for being here, being there, wherever you are. And one more time, let's thank Mr. Daryl Lennox. Thank, thank you so you much, sir. I appreciate you have, it, bro. You have a good day. All right, you too.